Caution. This podcast contains adult language, sexual themes, and depictions of violence that some may find triggering. This podcast and its hosts are not responsible for the accuracy of the material presented, as it is strictly based on our own limited research and personal opinions. The information presented is not to be confused with actual investigative files pertaining to the cases or official court and or law enforcement records and transcripts. What's going on, everybody? I want to thank you so much for tuning in to yet another episode of Bitch I Can't Pod. Y'all, I am trying to be consistent. I'm trying to record these episodes in advance. I'm trying to do do it in bulk so we have episodes and we can get on a regular schedule. How it's looking right now is you're going to have new episodes every Monday. Um, That's why there's a little bit of lag. I, I know in the last episode, I mentioned that if, you know, you, um tag me in some of my stuff that you're sharing i'll mention you on the next episode well i can't really do that when i'm recording in advance and i didn't really think that through but i will still give you your goddamn shout out whenever i see the shit it will just happen whenever it gets recorded so it might be a few episodes down so wanted to clarify that but thank you guys for listening and for sitting here with me while we talk Today's story is going to be a hoot. Today we're talking about that thing that runs thicker than water. We're talking about bloodlines and family ties. Today's story will have you asking yourself, how far would you go to protect your family's darkest secrets and make your parents proud? Yeah, guys, we are taking a trip back to the 1980s again. However, we're going to Argentina this time to talk about one of the most shocking stories to ever make headlines. We're talking about La Familia Puccio and how this clan cemented their names in one of the most fucked up and unimaginable ways possible. So sit back and relax, y'all, because today, (sighs) bitch, I can't. All right, y'all, so let's go ahead and jump into this bitch and get this shit started. Lube it up. Let's dive in. In an affluent neighborhood in the wealthy suburb of San Isidro in Buenos Aires, Argentina, in the early 1980s, a seemingly normal-ass family lived in a large gated home that was connected to a sports equipment shop uh, that the family ran and owned as well. Now, this family consisted of two loving parents, Archimedes and Epifania, and their five children who all lived at home. They had three sons, Alejandro, Daniel, and Guillermo, and two daughters, Silvia and Adriana. Now, Alejandro, Daniel, and Silvia were all adult-aged, and uh, Guillermo was in high school, and Adriana, she was, like, in middle school. So, let's talk about, you know the members of this family and like at least the adults and like what they do. So Archimedes was an accountant and lawyer who was a member of the Argentinian Secretariat of Intelligence uh, during the dictatorship era of the national reorganization process. So basically he worked for the CIA, but of Argentina, like just to put this in stupid terms and it's probably not, you know, completely correct, but whatever, close enough. Uh, And Epifania, she was an accounting and mathematics professor. Uh, Their daughter, Silvia, was a respected art teacher in the uh, city. And Alejandro, the oldest son, he was a well-known union footballer. Well, this family, they were super well-liked in their community, and they were honestly considered like the perfect family, model family, upstanding citizens, just like everybody was like, oh my God, like... Ugh, I want to be like the Puccios. Well, their oldest daughter, Sylvia, like I said, she was the art teacher. um, But she wasn't married, so she still lived at home. And the other two sons, Daniel and uh, Alejandro, were also adults, but they lived at home as well. I guess maybe back then, you didn't really move out um, until you were married at that time. Especially in like a, you know, a smaller town or in like the suburbs. I don't know. Well... When this family wasn't, you know, busy having, you know, happy little dinners around the big-ass table they all sat at, they were either at church service at this church that they could, like, walk to. It was so close. Or they were at one of Alejandro's rugby matches. Now, Alejandro played in the Argentinian National Rugby Union team and was one of their best. 
uh, he debuted on the first league in Club Atlético in uh, Club Atlético de San Isidro in 1977 at age 19, where he played until August of 1985, which is where this story um, really takes a turn. Uh, he was chosen in 1979 to play the South American Tournament of Rugby. He played a total of five matches and scored three goals, tries, whatever you want to call them. Um, he was the champion in 1979 and also won Torneo de la Urba in 1981, 1982, and 1985. Like, let's just say he's like a bad bitch on the rugby field, which rugby is something I don't understand. Like, my husband is like a soccer fanatic. He plays... Um, still, I play on one league with him. Like, listen, bitch, I am very entry level and I'm not good. I can't imagine if you could pick that ball up and like run with it and like dive into people with like no equipment on really. And they'd be having their heads in each other's butts. Like, it just seems like a lot. So uh, Alejandro really had to be a bad bitch to be one of the best. Now, being the oldest child, Alejandro had a lot of weight on his shoulders. I mean, firstly, he was, you know, an all-star athlete who was recognized throughout his country and like and his suburb, everybody fucking knew him. He was like a celebrity. So naturally, you know, pressure came with that. But he was also under a lot of pressure because he was old enough to engage in the family business, and so he did. Now, while their dinner table might have been full of smiles and dad jokes and shit, there was a much darker secret lying just beneath their feet in the basement. But we'll get back to that. Before we dive into the dark side of this well-polished family and their, you know, just fucked up shit they had going on, we have to talk a little bit about the head of the household, the leader of the pack, Archimedes. Now, Archimedes Rafael Puccini was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina on September 14th, 1929. So yet again, another Virgo, another psycho. And here's the deal, like, <laughs> Lady Red, you're out there. Beyonce, you're out there. I know, like, sane Virgos, but when I start researching shit for this show, the Virgos really steal the show. And maybe it's because they're so organized and they are such goal, you know, go-getters. Like, maybe that's why. Okay. Anyways, he was born on September 14th of 1929. Um, his family named him after the Greek mathematician, physicist, astronomer, and inventor, which I'm sure we've all heard of Archimedes. Now, uh, when they did that, I'm sure they were probably like, oh, let me name him something iconic, because baby's, our baby's going to be an icon, but, I mean, they weren't wrong. It was just the worst fucking kind of icon. Now, Archimedes was an accountant, lawyer, entrepreneur, and like I said, he's an ex-member of the Argentinian Secret Service. Now, he served during a period of time that is referred to as the Dirty War, from 1974 to 1983 in Argentina. Now... I'm going to give you all a little history lesson. The Dirty War, or in Spanish, Guerra Sucia, is the name used by the military junta or civic military dictatorship of Argentina for the period of state terrorism in Argentina from 1974 to 1983. This was a part of Operation Condor, during which military and security forces and death squads in the form of the Argentine Anti-Communist Alliance hunted down any political dissidents, dissidents uh, and anyone believed to be associated with socialism, left-wing Peronism, or the Montoneros movement. It is estimated that between 9,000 and 30,000 people were killed or, quote-unquote, disappeared, many of whom were impossible to formally document due to the nature of the state of terrorism. Now, the primary target like in many other South American countries participating in Operation Condor, were communist guerrillas and sympathizers. But the target of Operation Condor also included students, militants, trade union unionists, writers, journalists, artists, and any citizen suspected of being left-wing activists. They were all killed in this attempt by the junta to silence social and political opposition, which is fucking wild. So by the 1980s, the economic collapse, public discontent, and disastrous handling of the uh, Falklands War resulted in the end of the junta and the restoration of democracy in Argentina, effectively ending the dirty war. Now, many members of the junta are currently in prison for crimes against humanity and genocide, which is fucking wild because I've actually never heard of this shit before. 
Um, but the dirty war left a profound impact on Argentinian culture, which is still felt to this day. Okay, so now that we've had our little schoolhouse rock moment, we got to get back to the story. So during that insane fucking era, um, our boy Archimedes uh, obviously gained some extensive firsthand knowledge about kidnapping bitches and torturing people and the disposal of bodies, like all this shit. He's learning all of this. So by the end of the dictatorship in the early 1980s, he's older. So him and his homeboys, they've like aged out of the system or whatever, and they sat down and they're like, bitch, are you bored? And they're like, yeah, me too. And it's like, okay. This is when they decided to start their own little side hustle business. And they weren't out selling Herbalife or Avon or Feet Picks. Oh, no, 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 no. These unsuspecting ass goons decided to start kidnapping people. And by people, I don't mean just regular people. I mean the members of wealthy families while they were pretending that they were terrorists from a communist group. And then they would demand these massive, insane ransoms. Now, this business model, if you want to call it that, is one that I think we're all pretty well accustomed to. We've heard it in, like, movies and TV and in real life, obviously. And, I mean, it makes sense. The family gives you money. The kidnappers give back the family members. Well, this minor detail, the whole giving back the family members, this is where Archimedes' version takes a sharp fucking dark-ass left turn. After collecting these massive amounts of ransom money, he would kill the people anyway. He would literally just be like, all right, thanks for the money, like, thanks for the memories. Um, Time to kill your relative anyway, which is just so sick and fucked up. But I mean, also, I guess it was a way to protect himself from, like, any sort of liability or if the person figured it out. Even though they would, like blindfold these people and throw a bag over their head. I guess he just did not want to take a chance and didn't give a fuck and was, you know, with the Secret Service during this crazy-ass era where this shit was the norm. So he was just like, well, it's another Tuesday. So I'm sure you're sitting here wondering, how was he able to pull this off, this dad, this, you know, family guy, this accountant, how the fuck was he able to pull this off? They ran a store that was connected to their house. Like, how was he doing all this and still making it to his fucking son's uh, rugby games? Well, this is where the family uh, comes into play. And this is where his oldest son, Alejandro, the rugby star, the messy of the family, this is where he comes back into the picture. Two of the four known victims uh, of this kidnapping, murder, fucking situation by the Pucci, Puccio family um, were Ricardo uh, Man- Manaukian and Eduardo Aulet. Now, these people, what's so fucked up about these two guys? They were Alejandro's friends. The third victim um, of the four, his name was Emilio Naum. Uh, he was killed during the kidnapping attempt because he resisted. So he never you know, made it to the kidnapping site. Now, the first person, Ricardo, he was a rugby player. And he was also a friend of Alejandro's. So Alejandro actually just lured him to their house. In the, there's a movie that was made about this family, which I'm going to talk about that later. In the movie, they showed that he pretended, pretended like he had a flat tire. And then his friend saw him and was like, oh, shit, let me give you a ride. And then he had his father's, you know, click intervene, cut off the car. They threw a bag over his head. And his family had to pay a ransom of $250,000 while they kept him in the fucking basement for nine days. He was held captive in a bathtub where he laid until they murdered him after they got the money. They would use the victims. The reason they kept the victims alive is because they would use them to like write letters to their family. They wanted their families to see their handwriting, to know that their person was alive. And in these letters, like the, the victims would be like, hey, you know, please give the money. They'll release me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Long story short, after they got the $250,000, they shot him in the neck, which is fucked up. Three times in the neck. Jesus Christ. Now, Archimedes, he kind of reeled in the exorbitant amount of money he was requesting from these, you know, ransoms um, for the second victim, who was another person who was friends with Alejandro. He was uh, the guy Eduardo. Now, Eduardo was an engineer. This time, he only wanted $100,000. So they initially held this guy captive in a closet, but then they found out he was claustrophobic, so they moved him to the basement um, as well. Um, Once they got the money... 
they killed him. And they would, like, have the families, like, leave this money in, like, somewhere random. And um, Archimedes would be the one making the calls to the family from random telephones throughout the city, um, like, pay phones, and, like, giving them a call, like, hey, I've got your relative. Then, you know, they would do, like, a drop where they would meet up, and he would, like, give them, like, a letter to prove that he had their relative that had gone missing. And then they would do a drop to bring pick up the money or whatever, and then he would kill the relative, which is just so fucked up. Now, like I said, the businessman named Emilio, he died during a struggle. Like, they didn't even get him home. Now, having given these details of, like, these first three of the four known kidnapping victims, it's important to note that everyone in the family, aside from the youngest daughter, Adri Adriana, who was, like, in middle school, they were all aware of what the fuck was going on in the home, which is so fucked up. Like, just imagine, like... I mean, my parents did some weird shit when I was growing up, and they were, like, in a fucking Christian cult, and it was super embarrassing, and it, I knew something wasn't right with what was going on at home, but, like, I can't imagine that they're fucking torturing and murdering people in my, our goddamn basement, and I know about that shit. Well, this is when their youngest son, who was not in the family business, cause remember, there are three sons, Daniel, who is helping um, daddy kidnap people, Alejandro, who is helping to, like, fucking lure people. He's like finding the goddamn victims. And then there was Guillermo. Guillermo was too young. Now, Guillermo planned like some sort of school trip of some sort. And he fled the country as a teenager. Fled. Like when I say wherever he went for this school trip, he's like, I'm not coming back because he just could not deal with what the fuck his parents had going on. There were two daughters. Remember, there's one that's older who's a school teacher. She didn't participate in it, but she knew. She lived at home. She knew what the fuck was going on. It was the youngest one, Adriana, who just, she didn't know what was going on. Now, oh, this is just heavy. Um, Archimedes, the dad, he really was full of himself. Like he really thought he was brilliant and he thought he can get away with this sick ass side hustle and he's like i can continue doing this like what fuck a repercussion what's a repercussion like i do what i want well he thought this bitch he thought until their fourth and final victim which is where they were they got it fucked up now they kidnapped a businesswoman named nelina bolini de prado now she's the only kidnapping victim of theirs to survive Police grew suspicious, and they ended up raiding the Puccio home. Now, you're probably like, how the fuck did, what do you mean they grew, police grew sus suspicious? Well, we're going to get there in a second. So, this time, Archimedes had tried to be super smart. When calling her family to demand the ransom, he tried to make them believe that he had her out in the countryside. And he also tried to make the woman, the victim, believe the same thing. Now, he placed bales of grass around her where they kept her in the basement, played a cassette of uh, wild birds singing, and waved a fan to simulate breeze. <laughs> I mean, mind you, she's blindfolded, but I mean, really? Now, what? How this? how the police got tipped off is the phone company employee raised an alarm that these calls sounded suspicious. All these people have been going missing, and everyone assumed that it was, you know, like, you know, these communists or these these guerrillas, these, um, you know, gangsters are out here doing it. Meanwhile, you know, we know who it was in this these instances, at least. So these phone companies were getting tipped off to, like, or listening in for suspicious behavior, suspicious phone calls, weird shit that's going on. So they tipped off the police, and they ended up saving Nalita's life. The whole family was arrested um, after her discovery on August 23rd, 1985, when the police got a search warrant. I don't even know if they needed one there. They just busted the fuck in and <laughs> found this poor woman being tortured and kidnapped, or was who was kidnapped and being tortured in the goddamn basement. Now, Archimedes was arrested by the Division of Frauds and Scams of the Argentine, 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 uh, Federal Police on August 23rd, 1985, like I just said. But he got arrested at a gas station while he was extorting Nelita's family via payphone for the ransom payment. Alejandro was arrested that same day while he was at home with his girlfriend, Monica, who was a kindergarten teacher, which, Jesus Christ, that's fucked up. When Alejandro was arrested, he denied any participation in the organization um, criminal activities. He's like, I had nothing to do with any of these, uh, these uh, activities that my dad's criminal organization is up to, um, neither his... Uh, players on his team or his friends or his girlfriend believed that he was guilty. Like, they all were like, yo, he's innocent, free Alejandro. Now, when Alejandro was taken to court in late 1986, he attempted to kill himself 
in the courthouse. He jumped from the fifth floor inside of the building, which is fucking insane. <sighs> now, as a result, his suicide attempt, because he lived, I think I said that, right? He attempted to kill himself? Yeah, he fucking lived, y'all. His suicide attempt caused him to suffer from convulsions for the rest of his life, and he was uh, medicated with antipsychotics. Um, on December 26th of 1995, here we are, there we are 10 years later, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. At first, he was visited by his girlfriend, Monica, until she, he ordered her to stop coming. Later in the 1990s, he married someone, a woman who he met named Nancy, who he met during his years in prison, I guess like a fan, someone who was writing him letters. He never accepted any responsibility for the crimes uh, that he was convicted for. He always maintained his innocence, which is kind of crazy. He remained in prison until April 7th of 1997 when he was released due to um, a veto of this law, which is why he got uh, released. Due to a veto of this law, he was rearrested on in 1999. Now, he studied psychology, and in 2000, he was allowed to get out and make laboring activities, apparently. So after 22 years in prison, uh, Alejandro was finally released, like for real, for real, um, from the Buenos Aires prison in uh, November of 2007. Now, what's fucked up? I mean, whatever. He was a, he killed people allegedly. He ended up dying just a few months after getting out of the out of prison for all those fucking years. He got infected in a hospital where he'd been hospitalized for his convulsions. Um, and he died of that infection. And what's really fucked up is allegedly no one attended his funeral, which is kind of crazy. Now, moving on to the next son, Daniel. The location of this son um, is unknown. He only served a few years in prison. I guess he wasn't in it in the family business as deep as Alejandro was. He was just, he did these few years, got out, and then kind of disappeared until September 17th of 2019, when he was arrested during a routine drug route, uh, drug route uh, bus inspection in Brazil. So he was arrested for carrying falsified Brazilian identification documents. Um, after checking with Interpol, it was concluded that there was no pending arrest warrants for him. Um, in his possession was $5,000 in cash, which according to him was a gift from his brother. So I don't really know what happened with his case. It's very unclear. But he had been apparently staying beneath the radar or above the radar, how would you say? Off the fucking radar until 2019. Now, the son that left, Guillermo, son number three, the one that left in the early 80s and dipped as a teenager and like left Argentina, he um, just went on to live his life. And the statute of limitations for his alleged crimes expired in 2013. So he will never be tried and never contacted his family again that anyone knows of and disappeared. Now, the mom, Epiphania, she spent two years in jail and then was released due to a lack of evidence. She allegedly lived in that same fucking sick-ass house where they tortured people in Buenos Aires until 2015, allegedly. But I also heard that she left there and moved to an apartment in Buenos Aires where she stayed until 2015. That's the only correlation I have there is that she dipped in 2015. And you're like, what happened in 2015? Well, that was when the movie about this family called The Clan was released. Uh, fun fact, I saw this this movie in a film festival um, in Tampa, I believe. It was either in Tampa or in Chicago. I can't remember which one I saw it in. I saw it in a film festival back in 2015 before it hit theaters, and it was an, an incredible movie. It's called The Clan. It's available on Prime Video. You can rent it. But anyways, when that movie came out, she dipped, and her whereabouts after that have like unknown. She's got to be like in her 90s now anyway. Nobody knows where she is. Um, of the daughters, so now we're moving on to the daughters. There are two. So Sylvia, the one that was the art teacher, she was a, sus a suspect, but she was actually acquitted due to a lack of evidence. In 2011, though, um, she died of cancer, which is sad. Uh, she had continued being a teacher and... I guess just lived her life however the best you can do it after something as crazy as this. Uh, the youngest child and the last daughter, Adriana, she was unaware of the crimes being committed in the house. Like She was the one that was too young to know what the fuck was going on. Apparently, uh, she went to go live with like her uncle or someone, like an extended relative, and uh, had to undergo years and years and years and years of very intensive therapy. I mean... Duh. I mean, I, I, I literally can't imagine 
what she went through, just kind of figuring all that out, like what was going on in your household. Like, yeah, your parents and your siblings were fucking murdering people downstairs while you had no idea. You were the only one who didn't know, which is just nuts. She did change her name, apparently, and just just gone on to live her best life, and I hope she's doing well. She's somewhere in her mid-40s right now. This leads us to the climax of where are they now, what happened to them. Uh, let's talk about dad. Let's talk about papa. Let's talk about Archimedes. Now, he was sentenced to life in prison where he became a lawyer, which is kind of crazy. He was paroled in 2008 and lived for five more years. He died in 2013 uh, of a stroke at the age of 82. Um, apparently, nobody went to his funeral and nobody claimed his body which is crazy because his wife was still alive. Um, but I guess, you know, she pulled that Taylor Swift album out and said, we are never, ever, ever getting back together, uh, or nor am I picking up your body. So she didn't pick up his body, and he was buried in an unmarked grave to, until the end, right up until the moment that this man died. He maintained his innocence. He did allegedly, though, keep a list of the victim's family members and of the judges and police that were involved in him and his family's discovery and imprisonment. I don't know what he kept that list for, and I don't. it's not written why he kept it, but um, he said he was innocent. He was like, I don't know what y'all are talking about. These people you found tortured in my basement, um, uh, I didn't do this. It was this organization, this criminal organization that made me do it. So it's all just fucking nuts, y'all. Just to think, like, you you see people in the grass, they say the grass is always greener, and you see people, you're like, oh, they have this perfect life. You really don't fucking know. But yes, thank you guys for tuning in and listening to this episode of the show. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for sharing the show with friends. Thank you for sharing the show on your Instagram stories and however else you're sharing it. I really appreciate it. Once again, if you share my little video trailers that I post, the little teasers, if you share one of those on your story or just share that you're watching the show, you will get a shout out in the beginning of an episode. It won't necessarily be the next one, but at some point you will get shouted out because I am recording these in advance. It's a little hard, but I will shout you out. I promise. Uh, make sure that you are leaving a review if you like on um, Apple Podcasts. And yeah, guys, thank you for tuning in. Have another uh, a great another week or I don't know why I say another week, whatever. Have a great week. Don't fucking kidnap people. And yeah, we will talk soon. Bye.